The European Union on trial, all or nothing. In the interview, Elmar Brook, chairman of the EP Committee on Foreign Affairs. The euro is under threat. The European ideal is being put to a severe test. How dangerous is the situation? Everything is interconnected. If the euro fails, Europe's internal market will start to break apart. A lot of people would lose out, and problems like unemployment will deepen. Then the European ideal will be in danger. Periods like that are a breeding ground for left and right-wing populism. We know that from history, so we've everything to lose here. We'll talk about the crisis in a moment. Mr. Brock, you've been a member of the European Parliament for the past 32 years. I'd like to start by asking how and why you took an interest in Europe. I developed an interest at school. I joined the Young Conservatives after reading a book by American historian Gordon Craig. He wrote that Konrad Adenauer was the first German statesman to break out of the confines of the nation-state and create a lasting peace in Europe. That was the moment that convinced me. In your party, the Christian Democrats, you're considered the Minister for Europe. You're chairman of the European Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee, so you travel around a lot. What do people outside of Europe think about the continent? At the moment, they're nervous that we won't be able to handle the euro crisis. Many see Europe as a stabilizing force in a multipolar world. We're the world's biggest trading power. We have almost 30% of the world's GDP. But if we can't find a common voice on issues like the economy, trade, finance and foreign policy, Europe will continue to lose influence. And every country in Europe will lose influence. So many people are worried that Europe will cease to be a stabilizing factor. Let's go through some of the hot spots in Europe, starting in the east. The center-left government in Romania has brought impeachment proceedings against the president. It's used emergency laws to limit the high court's powers. What's happening there? It's virtually a coup. They've suspended the constitution, suspended laws. You can't use a majority in parliament to invalidate the constitution. The rule of law is there to defend certain principles, to protect minorities, to guarantee democracy and legal process. You can't suspend all that simply because you have a majority. The EU, EU leaders have made clear that they won't accept what's happening in Romania. What would be a suitable response? We have to follow the example we set in Hungary. The European Commission must make clear to Romania that if things aren't set right, there will be measures taken, ending with consequences at the European Court of Justice. And if the very principles of the European Union, democracy and rule of law, are at stake, then we may have to enact Article 7. That's the loss of voting and membership rights. That's right. We have to make clear that members of the European Union have to fulfill fulfill the principles of democracy and rule of law. You mentioned Hungary as another problem country. The nationalist conservative government of Prime Minister Viktor Orban is remodeling state and society. Observers fear it could result in one-party rule. Do you also see that danger? No, the last elections weren't properly contested. Next time, all signs point to them losing their two-thirds majority. It's never good when a party has a two-thirds majority. The Commission has also pressured them to wind back changes to media laws and other things. These past days have seen the Hungarian Constitutional Court strike down the forced retirement of judges. That was one of the biggest threats to an independent judiciary. That was exactly the issue the Commission brought before the European Court of Justice. I feel now that Hungary is reversing many decisions, and pressure from Europe is keeping other nations in line. 
Der Druck Europas. Looking at other countries in the region, that pressure is also on Bulgaria. It hasn't made any headway in the fight against corruption. Was the EU too hasty in granting these countries membership before they'd met the strict entry conditions? Wurden die aufgenommen, bevor sie die recht strengen europäischen Spielregeln erfüllen? Also kein Land hatte bisher alle Regeln erfüllt, auch damals. No country has ever met all the conditions, not even East Germany. That was essentially an accession to the EU. But so far it's always worked out, and countries developed in the right direction. In Romania we have the situation of a country heading in the wrong direction. So we have new consultation and verification mechanisms in place to exert pressure and make sure the process is adhered to. But I must say, I too underestimated the problems in granting these two countries membership. The EU sees itself as a soft power and wants to set an example around the world. Is that possible when individual members like Romania flaunt basic democratic principles? It wouldn't be if we accepted it. In the case of Hungary, the government is coming back into the fold. Romania will be another big test, a test of whether we can succeed in harmonizing democracy and rule of law, and a test of our credibility to the outside world. German Chancellor Angela Merkel has often said, if the euro fails, Europe fails. Is she right? I'm afraid so. It won't happen with a bang, but I think it will move gradually in that direction. If the single currency fails, some nations will return to tighter capital controls, protectionism, and the European market will grind to a halt. The cohesion will be gone. Many people think that Europe has achieved its original aim of peace, so Europe also has a problem of being taken for granted. When I see the reactions in many member countries, I worry that people aren't fully conscious of the original European ideal after World War II. Never again war, never again dictatorship. In part, it's our mistake, because we haven't communicated the problems. So now it's even more necessary to have a more informative and transparent dialogue with EU citizens einen sehr viel stärkeren, informativen und transparenten Dialog mit den Bürgern zu treten. The sovereign debt crisis and now the euro crisis have been around for two and a half years. Do governments need to consider bolder action to resolve it? It's not so simple. In the US, they'd turn on the presses and start printing more money. Some suggest that. But you don't solve the problem. The Americans will have huge problems with their national debt in two or three years. Their deficit is growing dramatically, way over the European average. I think fiscal sovereignty is a good thing. Over the past 14 months, we've introduced much better rules. We need structural reforms to increase our competitiveness. Fifty percent youth unemployment in Spain is nothing unexpected. In good economic times it was around 30 percent. But when you have the wrong education system, those are the consequences. So education in Spain has to be reformed to get the economy working. We need a more rigorous application of European structural policies, which have become lax in certain areas. That applies to increasing the competitiveness of small and mid-sized companies and creating a framework for cooperation between business and universities. If we can manage that, in 2014-2015 we'll be much stronger compared to Britain. This is most important. It's not a national debt crisis, it's a financial crisis. We have high national debts because we bailed out the financial sector, and now they're telling us that we have too much debt. So if we don't regulate the European and global financial sectors so they don't do the same thing to ordinary people as in 2008, then we'll never solve the problem. That's why regulation of the financial markets is of the utmost importance. The German government has decided to push for a fiscal union as a political means to keep the common currency more stable. Well-meaning experts say it could take seven to ten years to create a fiscal union. Does the euro have that much time? We have to examine two levels. We have many opportunities to move forward. 
That's why establishing the banking authority is already possible with the current agreement. Considerable progress has been made, and we have to examine all the details of the agreement. There's still a lot of wiggle room. And there's a second level. How do we achieve changes to the treaty that would lead to political improvements, including foreign policy? That would take at least four years, so discussions only about changes to the treaty are an argument to do nothing. So we have to focus on finding a solution to this crisis. If we know our goal, we'll also know our obligations. Moving forward with this political union could perhaps help during this crisis. That will make it clear that Europe wants to close ranks. I think it's an important message we have to send to the world. Germany is getting a lot of bad press throughout Europe at the moment. The government's actions are considered hard-hearted and egotistical. There's talk that Berlin is doing too little in a half-hearted effort to save the euro. What's your view as a European with a German passport? It depends who you talk to. The Finns, the people of Luxembourg, the Dutch and the Austrians broadly share Germany's view. They're just not as open about it. But other countries are critical. I think solidarity means that everybody has to do their part. Everybody has to abide by the rules, and when they do that, they're entitled to solidarity. Solidarity is a two-way street, and we want to achieve a process of reforms. Instead of covering up the crisis, we must resolve it. That has to be our task. And we have to communicate this much better, that we want to see this as part of a grand plan. We have to achieve three things fiscal stability, structural reforms to be more competitive, and growth. Elmar Brok, Elma Brok, Chairman of the European Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee, thank you for joining us.